Hello, my name is Peter Anthony Gallo. I am giving you the uh, multimedia version of the presentation that was uh, presented at the uh, symposium organized by King's College London on the subject of sexual exploitation of women and children by aid workers uh, today, Friday, 14th of May, 2021. Unfortunately, when I delivered it, the, uh, there was a technical glitch which resulted in the slides not being visible, so people present only got the radio version. I am speaking on the subject of uh, barriers to change and the need for accountability and reform of the UN. So, in the time available to me, I have to uh, rush through some basic premises, which I consider to be the self-evident facts that all men are created equal, and what the UN says and what the UN does is not always one and the same. Uh, I want to cover over uh, some basic information in the public domain, talk about the deterrence of crime and the UN corporate culture. But before I do that, uh, with a slight comic relief, and I will uh, address you on the subject of the traditional response that the UN has had over the years to allegations of corruption or other vices. And when asked the question, is there any corruption in the organisation, any child sex abuse or any other vice, the organization will traditionally say no. They prove that there is no corruption, vice or other malfeasance in the organization. And we know this because nobody ever reports any. And this, of course, is evidence of the fact that there is none to find. Or on the rare occasions, if someone does report it, the investigations never find any. And of course, this is evidence that there is no corruption, vice or other malfeasance. And here we go. Now, you can laugh at this if you like, and many people do, but the point that it, it addresses is consider two things. One is the reporting of misconduct, and the other is the investigation of misconduct. And specifically, the questions are, how does the UN actually treat staff who are retaliated against for reporting misconduct? Not interested in what they talk about, the procedures and the policy, I'm interested in the practice. And the second one is investigating misconduct. And the question there becomes is how does the UN actually react to inept investigation work or unethical behaviours by investigators? Now, to cover on that, moving back to uh, what I'm here to talk about, the information in the public domain, a history, a long history of a uh, and a widespread a reluctance to recognize the extent of sexual exploitation in the UN in field missions. If you don't believe me, consider the question of this. How is it humanly possible that TV crews and journalists can go to a place like Haiti and find more rape victims in, a, in the space of a week than the UN can actually admit to that are actually there all along? You want to get, pick another example, go and look back at the case of the uh, uh, Professor uh, Victoria Fontan, who reported um, sexual exploitation and abuse in a hotel in Congo. There's a widespread lack of whistleblower protection in the UN. Uh, the organization does a good job of telling you that such things exist. Go and look at the specific examples. Look at cases such as Martina Brostrom, who reported what was not sexual harassment, what was actually a sexual assault, or certainly an assault. When she worked for UN AIDS, the case of uh, Emma Riley, who reported um, what was reasonably believed to be misconduct in the organization for the High Commissioner, try again, the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. There are also numerous examples of what is either gross ineptitude or worse, a lack of integrity by investigators in the UN. If you don't believe me, go and look at the the case of uh, the DECOA investigations in 2006. You can look at the Ahuja judgments, the Mubanga judgments, and various others. If you don't believe me about the lack of integrity, go and read the Nuyan Krop and Postica judgment, or more recently, consider the implications of the hands in the pants case, which either implicates the investigations director or the secretary general. Take your pick. There is also a widespread and general lack of accountability for investigators who mismanage investigations. Again, if you don't believe me, go back to any one of them, like the Nguyen Krop and Postiga judgments and figure out what actually happened to the people involved in that case. Moving on, deterrence. 
suggest to you that encouraging victims to report assault, sexual assaults, is pointless without three things, one of which is genuine protection for those victims, something the UN is, quite frankly, unable to deliver. The second is competent and diligent investigation, which is something that the UN should be able to deliver but patently fails to do so. And the third is the political will to ensure that criminal actions are actually prosecuted, which is again something that the UN is not in a position to deliver. But raising awareness of the fact that something is illegal has no effect on deterring that criminal activity. It is proven experience, and any criminologist will tell you that the deterrent effect of any regulation is positively correlated with the likelihood of the perpetrator being apprehended and prosecuted. Simply put, if you want to deter people from doing something illegal, and it doesn't matter whether that is breaking windows, driving drunk, smoking in the subway, or sexually harassing women in the workplace, you don't increase the penalty, you, will inc you increase the chances that they will be caught and held accountable for it. Now, the UN is very fond of uh, pointing out that we don't do criminal investigations, but we are actually dealing with something illegal. And uh, there is, this is not just a, a question of antisocial behavior or social policy or toxic masculinity. Right? The sexual harass, the sexual offenses against women and children in UN peacekeeping environments and field environments is illegal. And it is something that the UN has failed to address for 20 years. Why? Because self-regulation doesn't work, but hold that thought. Now, when dealing with something illegal, the very important question is, who can you most rely on to report it? If you haven't got any reporting, it doesn't matter what subsequently follows. You can't assess the scale of the problem, nor can you investigate it if there's no evidence of anything actually happening. So who can you rely on to report it? Victims, uh, yes, possibly sometimes, but the problem is that victims are often victimized because they can be extorted. Um, withholding food and water, for example, um, and the, the organization having control over people's lives, you can't expect victims to report it. Um, a lot of the, the sexual exploitation and abuse cases in the UN is transactional sex. And here's a basic reality of our small businesses. Nobody who is running a business is actually going to report their own customers. And why would they? You expect refugee, other refugees or other locals to uh, report that uh, a UN official is sexually harassing or sexually uh, abusing someone else? We have credible investigative journalists reporting that refugees are being solicited for financial bribes for financial resettlement. In an environment like that, who is actually going to raise their hand to cause trouble for the organization when retaliation is rife? And the last one is, well, how about the staff, the staff of the UN, the staff of the aid organizations? They're the only ones you can rely on. And what excuse do they have for failing to report it? But then we have to consider the UN corporate culture, experience of which reveals that the organization considers its primary responsibility seems to be to go around protecting its own reputation. If you're a Star Trek fan, you'll recognize this as the prime directive. If you don't believe me, consider what happened in the Central African Republic in 2015. Right? No fewer than six cabinet-level officials of the UN sitting around, more concerned with protecting the reputation of the UN against something that had happened which did not involve UN personnel to the extent that all they were interested in was prosecuting and persecuting the one man in the organization who tried to take action to stop it. And it did not occur to any of them, or the risk management implications, that child sex abuse was something that the world would expect the UN to do something about and would expect them to stop it. But the UN corporate culture is fostered by three things, one of which is a primary focus on procedure, the second is a general lack of accountability, and the third is or consider the misapplication of uh, privileges and immunities under the 1946 Convention. And that is what I uh, wish to start with first. This question of uh, immunity. Now, anyone who has a basic reading level, the English language, can go and read section 18, which says very clearly that officials of the UN are immune from legal process for words spoken, blah, blah, in their official capacity. 
And those are the operative words, or should be the operative words in that clause. And here is the, the $64,000 question. When we are dealing with sexual offenses, if you are a, an official of the UN, I would rather suggest to you that it is no part of your job to be having sex with anyone else, be that conjugal, commercial, contractual, or anything else. It is not part of your job spec. It is what was known in tort law as an independent frolic. So why do we consider it so important that it be covered by immunity? Right, Section 20, it makes it very clear that the privileges and immunities are not for the personal benefit of the officials themselves, right? And that the Secretary General has the duty to waive the immunity where the course of justice uh, can be, where it would impede the course of justice not to do so, all right? Why is the question still being raised? And Section 21 talks about the obligation to prevent the occurrence of abuse and in connection with the uh, with privileges and immunities, right? The organization has said that they do not uh, invoke privileges uh, uh, privileges and immunities in the case of sexual offenses. That is slightly duplicitous. What will the UN will do is investigate the case first, and after they have dragged through the investigative process, however good or bad that may be, only at that stage will they consider reporting the matter to the, the, the national authorities. At the time I wrote my book on this, in the 10 years previous, uh, there had been only eight referrals uh, for prosecution, none of which appear to have actually gone anywhere. But there is very little point in the UN referring a case to the national authorities in a place like Haiti, saying that a rape took place two or three years ago, but the perpetrator no longer works for the UN, so he's probably back home in, shall we say, France or somewhere, possibly Spain, where he owns a house, but we don't know, but you're going to have to extradite him to start with. Right? And that's the second point, is we then don't know where the victim is, um, plus all sorts of legal implications that follow. The question should actually be addressed, at what point does the UN refer cases for the uh, a referral to national authorities. But I'll come back to that. Moving on, the question of procedure is something that basically typifies everything that the UN does, as everyone who's worked there will ever tell you. As far as it impacts on the question of sexual investiga investigations into sexual abuse, the thing to be concerned about, the thing that I'm concerned about, is that the organization considers that an investigation is simply a procedure to be followed. It is a procedure that you can be taught, and presumably, I mean, you know, a procedure that could be followed by a trained monkey. The only problem with that is, yes, it is a procedure, and there are certain issues that have to be addressed, but you still have to think, and the investigators still have to think. Senior officials of the, inv of the investigation division in OIOS have told their staff that the, the member states don't care about the outcome of an investigation. All they want to know is that something has been done. There has been an investigation. Nobody cares about the outcome. I venture to disagree on that. And the second thing, which is of concern to the staff members and has to be of concern to the staff members, is that the justice system in the UN only addresses failures to follow the procedure Unlike any other administrative tribunal in ju any jurisdiction I'm aware of, um, it does not address uh, unreasonableness and it does not address proportionality. We are fixated on this question of procedure. So what happens in a case where uh, the procedure has been followed and an investigation has been botched? The answer is nothing. You're left with a botched investigation. What happens in a, a situation where um, the uh, a recruitment process has been the, the very same thing. The organization is not concerned with the decision as much as they're concerned with the procedure. You don't believe me? Go and read the Chikara decision, which will discourage you from ever applying for promotion for anything anywhere else in the UN. And the, the last and the, the biggest area of concern is the lack of accountability. Oh dear. Now the UN considers itself a little world unto itself. Uh, and indeed it is, and it operates in a little solar system unto itself. 
But the lack of accountability is institutionalized. It is actually built in for a number of reasons. And I've tried to illustrate this in, in astrological terms. Whistleblower protection is the first one. The prime directive rules, right, and uh, the organization is not interested in finding retaliation. Retaliation is something which is endemic in the organization. I believe that the, the stats for the last year for which they're available, which is about seven or eight years ago now, um, the ethics office found retaliation, a prima facie case of retaliation, in less than 4% of the applications that were submitted for it. Um, there's something wrong with that statistic. Um, look at the case of Emma Riley, uh, which in attempting to answer the question of whether the retaliation that she suffered might have been at least in part due to reporting misconduct, you will think you will find that the ethics office took 28 pages of text to try and wriggle out of it. And if you consider what's happened to her ever since, whistleblower protection in the UN does not work, right? Um, it was pretending to work until the Wasserstrom decision came out by the UN Appeals Tribunal in 2014, which basically asserted that um, protection was a it was not a right; it was it was discretionary, right? Now the Secretary General could have um, amended the regulations within 24 hours to to correct that, and there was some. Uh, motive for him to do so because the US Congress had just passed legislation threatening to withhold 15% of the budget unless the UN did something with the whistleblower protection. And what did they do? They did absolutely nothing. In fact, they took two and a half years to bring out new regulations. Now, that is critical because of what I mentioned earlier. Who do we have to rely on to report rapes and other sexual offenses in the field? Once you get past the whistleblower protection question, you have to uh, address investigations. Something which I'm concerned is the number of uh, poor quality or inept investigations, which are not just uh, due to uh, this idea that you have to follow the procedure, but in many, of, many cases I ask myself, nobody can possibly be that stupid. Now the example, if people think I'm exaggerating, is, uh, is DECOA in 2016. Anybody interested in this subject should get a hold of the, uh, the, the analysis of the DECOA report. OIOS spent $500,000 to uh, look at over 160 allegations of sexual abuse and sexual exploitation. Um, no plan other than just to throw bodies to run around on the ground, achieved next to nothing. When presented with reports of another 216 victims, they basically just swept them under the carpet. And is anybody concerned about that? No, clearly not. But it demonstrates a serious and fundamental inability to organize or manage a major investigation. One I'm reading at the moment is um, quite an interesting, it's a UNDT case on the dismissal of the head of UNICEF in Papua New Guinea uh, for sexual harassment, which is fine apart from one minor point, is that the investigation failed to actually prove any sexual harassment. By comparison, you should compare that with the case of uh, uh, Luis Lures of UNAIDS, where the organization was bending over the other direction to prove that there was no harassment. Why? Now, the reason for that is because on paper, an investigation is supposed to be an analytical exercise in establishing facts. The cynical view in practice is that very often it's an exercise in just justifying a decision that someone's already decided they want to make. All right. Now, the problem is there is no oversight over the investigation function. And that's fine. So it allows the organization to carry out the most botched nightmare train wrecks of an investigation you ever saw, right? like the Lubad case, um, and what of it? No, none. What are the consequences for the investigators who make a mess of it? None. Does the organization actually care? Uh, apparently not. Um, look at the OCHA cases that uh, were concluded not long after I left. Uh, OIOS stumbled across evidence of terrorist financing. That was in addition to the fact that 80% of aid funds were being diverted. Was anybody bothered about that? 
Hmm, apparently not. The question I have, right, is why should the ordinary staff member have any confidence in this system? If you go back and you read the Nui and Krop and Postica judgment, right, every, organi every staff member in the organization has to ask themselves a very serious question, and that is if OIOS could treat their own investigators like that, how are they going to treat me? Right. And again, why did that happen? Because you go back to Inga Britt-Elenius' end of assignment report back in 2010, right, when she talked about how the Secretary General wanted to take control of the investigation function. Right. The system could not be designed any better if the objective was on paper, was to sabotage investigations. There is the conduct and discipline function, which serves to screen complaints, right? Why do we have to have complaints screened? The investigation function was supposed to be independent. But again, why does it that they have to go through? Why does another office of the UN have to determine whether or not they should be investigated? What actually happens is with these assessments is that uh, they serve to... Uh, essentially alert the subject of a complaint that he is under investigation, which gives him ample time to bribe or intimidate witnesses and compromise the investigation. And that is not just a hypothetical possibility. We saw it in practice. The other one is referrals, which is the insidious practice when uh, instead of investigating something themselves, OIOS has referred it to another office. The example I talk about, this one is of a lady by the name of Tammy Fisher, who was an UNPOL officer in Haiti, who reported three of her UNPOL colleagues for statutory rape. All right? What happened? Uh, the, the investigation was referred to the police division, which is the one division, of course, that has the greatest incentive to make sure that the three subjects were cleared. And guess what? They were cleared, notwithstanding the fact that don't go into there. There's the don't talk about the MEU. Then when you start looking at the, the UN Dispute Tribunal, this is supposed to be the, the salvation, if you like, or the, the defense of the staff member. The first 10 years of the organization, look at the number of the, the percentages of cases decided in favor of the staff member. It works out about 24%. Okay. I'll um, hold that thought because the next thing I want to talk about is the UN Appeals Tribunal. And this one is possibly the most illustrative in the uh, most mind-blowing statistic that I think I've ever seen in any UN report. This comes from the UN Office of the Administration of Justice, the 11th report for the year 2017. And oh look, there's a couple of charts. One is the outcome of appeals against UNDT judgment, blah, blah, blah. And they look very similar. Let me explain what they actually say, right? Someone says that if the dispute tribunal issues a judgment in which the staff member loses and they appeal, the chances of the UNAT reversing their loss is 5%. Now, what if the dispute tribunal issues a judgment in favor of the staff member where the administration loses? When the administration appeals, the chances of the UNAT reversing that decision is 93%. Now, if somebody can please explain to me how the same judges can make so few mistakes when deciding something in favor of the organization and so many mistakes when deciding something in favor of the staff member on the one in four chances where of one in four occasions when they do. Sorry, this is just uh, mind blowing. But look at the way this the, the reason this chart is deceptive. Uh, the colors have been switched around the other side. Don't worry about it. Moving swiftly on, because the next thing you've got to touch on is the registry. Why would the registry be a problem? Aha, because the registry actually controls the judges. Now, on average, to say judges are uh, returning uh, judgments in favor of staff members about one in four times. Look at the cases of um, uh, Judge Downing and how he was removed from the bench, right, uh, at the earliest possible opportunity to stop him completing a judgment on a case he'd already heard. And if you think that's suspicious, it was Judge Graziano before him who was removed, uh, her contract was ended on less than uh, 48 hours' notice. So to, I believe 
something like 25 or 30 cases that she had on her docket had to go back and be reheard. How can rehearing cases be in the best interest of anyone, especially when the, she was removed as part of a scheme to uh, clear the backlog? It doesn't make sense. Then what else have we got to worry about? Ah, my dear friends, the Administrative Law Division, right? The lawyers who represent the Secretary General. Why would they possibly be a problem? Well, <laughs> what when they withhold evidence? What kind of legal system do you have when they would withhold evidence, exculpatory evidence, from a staff member and from a tribunal? I'm not making that up. That was actually included very nicely. Thank you very much in the Internal Justice Council report. And it's not an unusual case. Look at the Nunu judgment. The investigations director fails to comply with an order, a direct order from a judge in withholding exculpatory evidence or withholding, withholding material evidence. In the real world, that is what causes police chiefs to go to jail. In the UN, it's perfectly acceptable. All right. And then we've got the Office of Administration of Justice, who is aware of all of this and quite happily encouraging it. But that is what basically supports the culture and the, you know, gives you an, an impenetrable mess that's not going to be um, tweaked or amended by one or two minor changes here or there. Which is why I brought in this mildly amusing diagram at the beginning. Laugh of it, if you will, but the tragedy is that this model works because not enough people care to do anything about it. And more than that, again, look at it, it relies on the fact that the UN has influence over the reporting of misconduct and is willfully blind to the inept investigation of misconduct. Is there a way forward? Well, we can start by admitting that self-regulation doesn't work, right? This is not a case where one or two little tweaks and changes. Rub it all out and throw it in again. What we require is a genuinely separate and independent agencies to investigate not just paternity, but allegations of external wrongdoing, i.e. criminal acts. All right. I think we also have to recognize that sexual exploitation and abuse is not and must not be covered by the 1946 Convention on Privileges and Immunities. And thirdly, and this is something that could actually be changed, I believe, very quickly, is that sexual exploitation cases should be referred to the national authorities of the, the jurisdiction involved when reasonable grounds to believe that a crime has been committed or established. We don't have to wait for years in order for the UN to conduct an investigation for an administrative purpose, which then compromises the criminal investigation that we're hoping to follow. All right. Now we have said, and boy have we had some criticism for it, the estimated number of victims of uh, sexual offences by UN personnel during Ban Ki-moon's term as Secretary General is 60,000. Works out at 6,000 a year. And it's been admitted that sexual exploitation and abuse is more prevalent among UN civilian staff, on a, certainly on a percentage basis it is, Compare that with the actual number of UN civilian staff members prosecuted for criminally for sexual offences, and the number is one in the entire 75-year history of the UN. But one out of 60,000 is not actually a, a fair comparison. Uh, he was jailed, actually, before uh, Ban Ki-moon's term. What we should be looking at, and taking figures from the, uh, the UN's own uh, published figures on this is look at the number of allegations received in that 10-year period and it works out at 843 right 843 and it was artificially high because of the the aftermath of the child sex abuse scandal in the car but 843 out of 60,000 is barely one and a half percent and that's what gets through the filtering system the, the ones that the, the Conduct and Discipline Unit will actually admit uh, were credible allegations. The other curious thing that you should look at on the, uh, the Conduct and Discipline website, now the UN makes a much fuss about that and claims that all of the allegations are posted online. Yeah. Um, look at the fact that uh, all of those cases, the perpetrator has been identified. There are no cases on there 
where the assailant is unidentified. Because the reality is that when a victim comes forward, unless she can uh, provide the name and address uh, of the man who raped her, uh, the UN is going to uh, mess around and say that he can't be identified. What oversight is there over the conduct and discipline assessment process? The answer is none. So I leave you, unfortunately, with the, the sad state of affairs that we cannot presently rely on either UN staff members always having the courage to report misconduct, and we cannot rely on the integrity or the competence of the organization to investigate misconduct. And that, in a nutshell, is why there is a need for an external body to do this. Thank you very much.